In 1910, an inferno grew on the border of Idaho and Montana, consuming an area of forest equivalent to the state of Connecticut, incinerating 89 individuals in the process, burning 3 million acres, and scarring the American people forever. Up until 1910, the United States Forest Service was mainly focused on regulating timber. Its firefighting division was limited, unorganized, and had never experienced a wildfire on a large scale. It had a critical lack of funding, no experienced personnel, and insufficient infrastructure, which came under scrutiny after the Northwest went up in flames. In the aftermath of the fire, the Forest Service acted and created new policies, techniques, and technologies that changed how they fought wildfires forever. A century later, through analysis of primary documents and current conditions, the true extent of the fire's legacy is revealed. How it saved the Forest Service, but doomed the forests themselves. In the summer of 1910, thunder boomed around the small mountain town of Wallace, Idaho. A dry lightning storm had formed and continued through the night. When the inhabitants of Wallace woke up, more than 1,000 fires were burning around them. For the forest rangers, reports of so many fires came in that it was impossible, with means at hand, to even begin to cope with the situation. However, the true nightmare wouldn't start until August 20th, when wind speeds started rising. By nightfall, winds surpassed 70 miles per hour, a torrential hurricane raging across the northwestern United States. The oxygen supplied by the gale, combined with the recent dry summers, created the perfect storm to engulf a forest in flames. Embers of the fires were picked up by the winds and carried everywhere, starting countless more fires in their wake. The amount of blazes was increasing exponentially until the hurricane propelled them all together to create a single, massive inferno. The fire spanned millions of acres, from eastern Washington to western Montana. With the extensive range of the fire and complete lack of personnel, the Forest Service stood no chance. In desperation, they recruited anyone in the area to help fight the fires. In Wallace, people had no choice. Just hours before the Great Fire reached the town, the mayor announced that only women and children could board the small escape train. The men were required to stay behind and fight the fire, and even the jails were opened so that the inmates could fight the fire as well. In Massachusetts, William Howard Taft, the 27th president, otherwise known as the fat man in the bathtub, monitored the fires from his summer home. After persuasion from the Forest Service, he sent the army to combat the fire. Nearly 4,000 soldiers traveled to the front lines under Taft's orders, aiding the primarily civilian firefighting force. Yet even with the help from the army, the fight against the fire was hopeless. For many firefighters stuck in the inferno, their mission changed to getting themselves out alive. One forester recounted, Flames hundreds of feet high fanned by a tornadic wind so violent that the flames flattened out ahead swooping to earth in great darting curves, truly a veritable red demon from hell. The Firefighters by Arthur Chapman Where Smith and Hennessy Edward Stowe were Casey and Lincoln small, the ranger listened and murmured low, they're missing chief, that's all. Where the smoke rolls high, I saw them ride, they waved goodbye to me. Good God, they might as well have tried to put back the rolling sea. I rode for aid till my horse fell dead, then waded the mountain stream. The pools I swam were red, blood red, and covered with choking steam. There was never a comrade to shout hello, though I flung back many a call. The brave boys knew what it meant to go. They're missing, chief, that's all. The awful conflagration was only put to rest by its original creator, nature. As if the prayers were answered, near the end of August, it started to snow. And it didn't stop snowing for ten days. The fire just destroyed all the air. But it, they got the fire out only because it snowed. They never really got the fire out, fighting fire. The Great Fire of 1910 brought nationwide attention to the Forest Service. The firefighters that fought the blazes were hailed as heroes, increasing public support to record highs, and eventually reaching Congress, 
when nearly doubled the budget of the Forest Service. The increased budget allowed for new firefighting infrastructure to be built on a scale larger than ever. New fire watchtowers, trails, and roads were constructed across the forests of the United States. Telephone lines connected the firefighters for the first time, allowing for quick and easy fire detection. Even new technologies were invented, such as the Pulaski, a hoe and axe combination that is now an essential tool for every firefighter. The Forest Service no longer relied on civilians or the military to combat fire. They were replaced with graduates from the new forestry schools who were professionally trained. The Forest Service was expanding at an incredible rate, and a new level of professionalism was emerging. Perhaps most importantly, fresh ideas emerged from the flames. Foresters embraced a new, simple dogma. All fire is bad. The Forest Service and U.S. citizens wanted to make sure that fire like the one in 1910 would never happen again. They implemented total fire suppression and entered a new frontier of zero-tolerance firefighting, changing America's forests and the way fires are fought forever. Total fire suppression entails early detection and swift extinguishment of every fire, with the goal of entirely removing fire from the American landscape. This aggressive firefighting stance led to the establishment of the 10 a.m. policy in 1935, which decreed that all fires must be put out by 10 a.m. of the following day. It also contributed to even more new firefighting methods such as planes and smoke jumpers. Although the Great Fire of 1910 undeniably saved the Forest Service by bringing it the funding necessary to fight fires more effectively, it ultimately made fires worse. The policies and concepts of total fire suppression were the beginnings of a literal war against fire. The 10 a.m. policy and other strict strategies made by the Forest Service meant nearly every single fire was fought off swiftly. However, forest fires in limited amounts are important. Natural fires increase biodiversity and act as sort of a reset for the forest, burning old trees and plants in favor of fresh new ones. Without fire, these forests would never reset, meaning the number of trees would keep increasing and the forests would keep getting denser. 100 years after the Big Burn, some forests have more than 20 times as many trees as they had before total fire suppression. More trees equal more fuel for a fire, which in combination with the hotter and drier summers caused by climate change means that when a fire eventually does break out, it will be even more catastrophic as it had that much more forest to burn. Forest fires are also nature's natural way of housekeeping, providing a natural shield for bigger fires by creating a fire-resilient landscape. When a forest gets burned, it will be more protected when another forest fire occurs. Ultimately, these problems added up and wildfires reached never-before-seen sizes. In the 1970s, it was finally realized that total fire suppression policies were incorrect and forest fires can sometimes be good, but it was already too late. Fires were burning bigger than ever before. In the last century, the total number of fires has decreased. However, the severity of the fires and the total acres they burned has increased. Generally, the fires are getting worse, partly from climate change, but also from the flawed implementation of total fire suppression after 1910. In 2022, there have been more severe fires than ever before. In the past decade, we have seen the increased severity with our own eyes. The Camp Fire took 85 lives and caused close to $17 billion worth of damage. The Cedar Creek Fire built a smoke plume so big and bad, it caused Seattle to have the worst air quality of any city in the world for a day. Right at this moment, if I go outside, I'll receive a lungful of smoke from the Bolt Creek Fire, just 40 miles from my hometown of Seattle. The legacy of the Great Fire of 1910 is truly a double-edged sword. On one hand, it undeniably helped fund and support the Forest Service, allowing it to become the organization it is today including better firefighting and technology. On the other hand, the total fire suppression and zero-tolerance firefighting employed by the Forest Service made fires worse in the long run. It is a legacy we are still dealing with today, and will impact our descendants for decades to come, either in brutal, fiery carnage, or perhaps better protected American forests that will strive onwards.